challenge. You can move to the next slide. All right, so generally it's very challenging to go through school, knowing fully well that what you plan to achieve might not be what you're gonna achieve. And sometimes you get discouraged, you don't you wanna give up because you wanna become a medical doctor. You've seen that that's not gonna happen. I'm here to encourage you today to just keep going. In my own case, during high school, I went through similar challenges that most people went through here. And the first picture all the way to the top, to the left side, you can see me and my friends there. I have four close friends then, right? They are very close. I can tell you for sure I was not the best student in class. Now it's very different from what my dad would say to me. He usually had to say he was the best student in class. <laughs> Uh, but I was not the best student in class, I can tell you for sure. But I did something, I made friends with the best brain in class, the very brilliant guys in class. The first guy sitting very close to me is actually here in Florida. I'm gonna tell the story as to how I came into Florida with his help, right? The other picture is showing the fact that when I was in school, I also had fun a little bit. We had friends, we go hard, we have some night life, moving from one place to another place and making friends. Then going through all these challenges, I still was not the so privileged kid because I came from a humble background, but I did not give up based on that. I still hope to see the world as my backyard and looking to the fact that I can always become whatever I want to become. And this other picture is showing recent pictures of the same high school friends that I had. Now, this picture is showing the picture we took here at Florida Atlantic University. This is this picture where we are actually doing some research in the lab. You can move to the next slide. All right, at the end of my high school, like most people, I want to become a doctor. And if you're from Nigeria, <laughs> if you don't become a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer, uh, basically you're a failure. If you're, if you're from Africa, you can relate to that. So for me, I tried my best. I want to become the medical doctor. I did the exam I'm supposed to do. I scored high, but for some reason, I couldn't get in. Some people say because the score was not high enough, some people say it's because uh, it's not connected enough. Who knows? But we have an exam in Nigeria we call JAMP that is very similar to what you guys take your MCAT to get into medical school. So I had to find other ways to get into the school and, of course, make sure that I go to school and, and get educated, having a second plan, plan B. I was able to gain admission into Obafemi. Aulawa University. That's the first picture you have all the way to the left side. Yes, that picture. We call that school Great Ife. That's, that's, that's arguably the best university in Nigeria. Uh, we call it king of all university in Nigeria. Again, admission. I couldn't get an, gain admission to study medicine. I gained admission to study agriculture, specifically animal sciences. Uh, like most people, I felt I deserved more than that because, I mean, I made friends with the best brain. I had good score. I could get into any school I wanted to get into because I worked hard for it. But I had to just accept the fact that I'm studying agriculture now. I dragged my feet all through, through it, not too much of motivation going on. But then I learned my lesson down the road. I got interested in leadership, for example. The third picture, all the way to the top, that's showing a student we have in, in the university with some professors there. During the last year in my undergraduate, I became the president of the department. And I was responsible for students, as a fellow student, a leading position, so to say there. Then I had good relationship with my head of 
department there, and that's the fourth picture there. At the end of my undergraduate days, I enjoy life. I went to Dina's. I actually thought I was going to become a model. As you can see in some pictures, <laughs> I mean, try to take some pictures looking cool and things like that. That was that was a good experience. I did that just because I was I was trying to just enjoy myself and think out outside of the box. At the end of my undergraduate days, I went for NYSC. Right, if you know anybody from Nigeria, that's a common program whereby you go and serve your country for a year. And basically you are not paid or even sometimes underpaid. We wake up 4 a.m. in the morning to get dressed and by 6 a.m. we are already working. We are already doing some work already. And that's talking about the, the, the light colored, the white colored top here, where you have NYC written on top of it. That's the NYC program in Nigeria. At the end of that, I finished my undergraduate. I wanted more from life. Right now I have a BSc in animal sciences. I, I thought that's not what life is all about. I wanted a life that is just more than having a farm or doing something like that. Therefore, I now started thinking about going for my graduate studies. At that time, I contacted my high school friend in the first picture. Now you can move to the next slide. I applied for the master's program in the United States of America through my friend from the first picture that I showed you. He was very helpful with that. I gained admission and I was supposed to go to the visa interview to, to be able to get my visa. That was unnecessarily prolonged more than I expected. When that happened, I received an email from FAU that <laughs> specifically my department that I, I came late to the school. Therefore, I should stay in Nigeria because I won't be getting the financial support that I need. And I actually responded to an email. <laughs> I was not so wise then. <laughs> I responded to the email. I acknowledged the email. Then I came down to United States of America thinking that, well, I could beg and just say, well, please, um, that, that was not my fault and I could get my financial support, but I couldn't do that because the department maintained their standard. Well, you, you came late and you're not gonna get your financial support. I thought it was a joke until I started contemplating going back to Nigeria because I was almost stranded in that kind of situation. I reached out to friends and family. I stayed and I, I continue my program. In the second picture on the top, you, towards the left side, you can see me and my advisor. That's the Dr. Kumi Diaka. He's a Ghanaian. He helped me through all my master's program, eventually through my PhD program. It was very helpful at supervisor. Then while I was doing my master's, um, I didn't just stay doing nothing. I got involved in campus. I was the assistant director for Graduate Professional Student Association. You can see me taking picture with the president of Florida Atlantic University towards the left side and President John Kelly when I was the student leader for Graduate Professional Student Association. I got involved, I started going through professional development program. I joined the Honor Society of Kappa Phi because I have good grades in school. I study hard. I knew I had to study hard. And I study hard while I'm getting myself involved. I also attended leadership conferences, for example, Florida International Leadership Conference there with a couple of people. I get to meet people from different backgrounds, sometimes people from African countries. I, I tend to see the overlap between the culture and hearing people sharing their experiences from other culture is something that I like to experience. Then also I volunteer a lot, right? You can see the, towards the bottom on the right side, we're actually cleaning the beach there. I got myself involved with a lot of that. And at, that was the point I now started moving from somebody who is 
financially not okay to somebody who is not getting scholarships, fellowships, because of high academic achievement and also high collegiate service. You can move to the next slide. When I was moving towards the end of my master's program, I was thinking, what next? And the only thing that came to my mind that was so clear is to go for my PhD. I, while I was at, going on with my master's, I applied for my PhD, actually. And the first time I applied, I got denied. A little bit of frustration came in. The second time I applied, when I was applying the second time, I approached the professors and have conversations about my application. I asked questions like, why, why, can't, why was my application not successful the first time? And what can I do to make my application stronger this time? And they told me the recommendation letters, GRE, I had to take the GRE again. And I got in, into the PhD program. And I thought, wow, everything is going to go fine now. I was wrong. At the beginning of my PhD, my first advisor told me my English was so bad, there was no way I could be a PhD student, <laughs> that I had to stop fooling myself. <laughs> I almost believed in, or for some reason, because of me working on myself, be belonging to associations like John Maxwell team, Toastmasters International, whereby I've been building up my confidence to be able to become a better communicator. I did not believe him. I, I did not believe my, my case was hopeless like he wanted me to. Therefore, I kept on, I changed my adversary. I started developing my communication skills. I joined John Maxwell team, all right? And that's why you see in the first picture on the way to the, to the top, I became certified as a John Maxwell trainer. I started training people. I trained my friend, my friend from the first slide from high school. He's also here in America. I trained my wife, his wife, my sister, and same picture there, and also some friends from church. Then I, things just started getting better, more financial support, more fellowship. I got the Florida Education Fund. That was the last fellowship that I got. I couldn't believe I got that because it was very competitive at that point. And I started just doing my best. And at 2020, towards the end of my PhD, the pandemic came in. COVID-19 was here, and there was a competition from FE that said, well, we should try to apply and see if we can help suggestions to help students cope during COVID-19 pandemic. And I applied alongside some other students. We won the funding for that. We started a student organization called FAU Keep Moving. And from that, I started interacting with other students. I have mentees, actually. I started mentoring students on so many levels. One of the highlights of my mentoring other students is when one of my mentees, she won the first place at the research competition as Zoe Bars. She, she's all the way, all the way to the right at the middle picture there. Then things started getting better. I became a US citizen, moving from international student that was really just tired and want to give up to somebody who is now almost getting a PhD. And I became a US citizen at the same time. Things got better along the way. You can move to the next slide. Then a little bit about my research, all through my master's program. At my master's level, I was looking at prostate cancer. I, I, we saw that during the treatment of prostate cancer, there was some drug resistance going on with most of the cancer cell lines that I used. Then I now try to fix that during my PhD. I use a new method called nanotechnology to further increase the therapeutic effect of the drugs that I was using. I made nanoparticles. I 
place the drug inside nanoparticles to make the drugs more effective. And I did some analysis as to how that was going. And we saw some positive results. Drug resistance was reduced using nanoparticles. You can move to the next slide. Then the major turning point for me was not just monetary aspect. Of course, it got better with money. I, I didn't have to suffer as much as I suffered when I came in. But then I also discovered that I had some feedback from my high school friends that they just couldn't connect the person I was when I was in high school to the person I was now. So that's, that's when I knew, well, I think that I'm improving. And that's my charge to you today, not to give up, don't give up. Even if somebody is saying you can't become anything because they just think you just nobody. Just keep improving, keep learning, and things will get better over time. And you can see that if I listened to my advisor that told me that I should just stop my PhD and I can't become a good researcher, I wouldn't have achieved this much. I, I didn't listen, I kept working hard. I had publications to show for the research that I've done and I'm still doing more research. You can move to the next slide. All right, so one of the things that I enjoyed as a researcher was just presenting my research, let people know about what I did in the lab, staying up late till 3 a.m., 5 a.m. sometimes. It's hard, but then when you had the opportunity to now talk about the research and which I had, I was really excited about it. And this is showing some pictures from the conferences that I have gone to. I won some first place prizes when I presented here at FAU and also outside. But in addition to all that doing, of going, doing research and presenting about the research, I also connect with people. I also network with other students from other schools, from Canada, outside of the country, and from just anywhere. And I also learned about their research and things like that. That's something that I found very interesting. Right. You can move to the next slide. All right, so like you know, PhD takes some time, right? Typically five years, some people do it less, some people do it longer time. But I knew I was gonna be there for some time. So I try to also look into my hobbies just to, to encourage myself and relax sometimes. I play chess. I, I think that's, that's a source of connection and communication with some people, especially people that like playing chess. We have some competition that was going on at FAU, outside FAU. And in the picture, you can see students from FIU that we went to, to play with a couple of years ago. We get to meet people from other schools and having conversations when you're playing games is something that is very nice. I also try to reach out to my African friends. I, if you look all the way to the bottom towards the left side, you can see that these are African group. We call it the Impact Group. That was initiated by my friend, now a doctor, Dr. Olumide Ademoshe there in the picture and some of the African friends there, which just bringing together people from all African countries and we meet on Sundays just to relax and have conversations. Then I also play instruments. I play the keyboard, I play the guitar, and I'll be getting my saxophone very soon. You can move to the next slide. All right, so now you're talking about the things that I also still were engaging in while I was in my PhD. I, I knew I had to get better in communication, written communication and also speaking. Therefore, I kept training myself. I, I was presenting here, the, the picture you have at the top to us, the, the fourth picture, you're looking at the, the picture from the Professional Development Day at Broad College. I was one of the facilitators there in 2019. And I also did some presentation at FAU We Lead. 
I have I have my pub my book published now, uh, which you're still going to see the the picture for that. Then I also did some talks all around inter interviews. I have my friend that inv in invites me to speak on leadership and education, and that's that's what you have going on here. It was a very good experience. Then I also went outside to leadership conferences to do some training. Uh, you can see us locking hands in that picture towards the bottom. That, that was a workshop outside the school. And I also went to high school. Uh, that's one of the high school I went to do some talk there, just to motivate the kids about science and make them get some interest in going to scientific disciplines. Yeah, you can move to the next slide. All right, the good question, how did I get into Broward College? Like I said, I knew that I had to develop my communication skills. I joined John Maxwell's team. I also joined Toastmasters International. I joined Broward College Toastmaster, and also I joined Girlfriend Good Morning Toastmaster. When I was at Broad College Toastmaster, I met my fellow Toastmaster, Dr. Nilo Marin. And I remember we were talking about what he's doing, just connecting after the meeting. He told me that he, he's teaching at Broad College. I said, wow, I was, I was, I've been trying to teach at Broad College. I said, well, maybe I should come and meet him in his, in his office the following day. And of course, being the person that I am, I, I didn't forget, I was the first person <laughs> to be at his office that morning. And he walked me down to the associate dean then. And from there, I started putting in my application. And eventually, I got a chance to teach at Broad College through the connection that I made at Broad College Toastmaster. Then, of course, I won some awards during speeches. I had leadership positions, still developing my leadership skills. I'm not there yet. It's the journey, and I'm still developing my skills. And that's something that everybody should do. You can move to the next slide. Then after a PhD, I did some celebration because I work hard. I also believe in celebrating success, especially small success. I did that. Then my friend from high school, Dr. Olumidia Demotion, also graduated. Uh, we celebrated with him, which was something that was, it was really big for me, having you succeeding and having myself also doing some, some progress, having people around me succeeding while I'm succeeding is something I, I, I like to see. And that was really good. You can move to the next slide. Then, of course, I'm still an adjunct professor here at Broad College, an assistant professor in, in another college. And these are the classes that I teach here at Broad College. I teach anatomy and physiology, the class and the labs. I teach BSc 2010, 2011, microbiology class and labs, and also environmental science, all right? And the whole purpose of this is for you not to be discouraged it doesn't matter if you're trying to have a particular degree and what you can do for now is getting another degree, right? Just keep doing it, register for your class. You might still have the opportunity to do the particular course you want to study for, but in the meantime, you have to work hard and register for class, especially for the spring semester that is coming. You can move to the next slide. All right, this is my contact information in case you have any question for me. Um, and of course, if you have more questions, uh, there's a book that I wrote, you can get that and also that will answer some of your questions. And thank you so much. And I'm going to give it back to uh, Professor Horridge. Thank you, Dr. Tolu. And I'm sorry for my trigger fingers just now. <laughs> As he stated, um, this is his email address that you can contact him with if you have any questions. However, if you do have questions for him now, we encourage you to place them in our chat because towards the end, we're gonna have a Q&A se session in which 
he can answer your questions that you may have. So again, thank you, Dr. Famuyiwa. Next up, we have Mrs. Rebecca Clark. Rebecca Clark earned a master's degree in science education at FIU and a master's degree in geosciences at FAU. She is currently working on a PhD in geosciences at FAU with a research focus on natural disasters and their impacts on disadvantaged socioeconomic communities. She spent eight years teaching in the K through 12 setting and now teaches full-time at Broward College's central campus in the geosciences department. Please help me welcome Mrs. Rebecca Clark. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, once again, I'm Rebecca Clark. And um, before anything, um, know that um, I am on central campus. And after my presentation, if you have any questions, my contact information will be there. But any of uh, the science professors are generally located in building seven. And that's true of myself as well. I'm in building seven, office 119. Um, I'm going to start just talking about uh, my early years and then move on to um, discussing my kind of awkward at times path uh, into teaching and uh, into also, you know, being at Broward College. So to start, I was born uh, in Long Island, in Long Island, New York, and um, that's not where I stayed forever, um, but it is where I ended up again, uh, you know, time and time again in my life. Uh, my father, who's pictured right there on the right, he, um, he was in the military, so he was in the army as a medic. And so we spent a lot of time moving from place to place. And so, especially in my earlier childhood, I might have done a year in schooling somewhere, and then we picked up and moved, and I did a year of schooling somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he actually... The shortest story ever, um, he actually met my mom um, at a retirement party in a pub in England because my mom is English. And um, so as an English um, parent, you know, when my dad was in the military overseas, we moved back to um, her hometown in Liverpool and spent some time there. Um, moved back to San Antonio, Texas, and then back to Long Island. So I spent a lot of my childhood moving around. Um, but by my middle school years, I, we mostly settled uh, in Long Island, where um, I went to middle school and then high school in a very small town um, and high school called Shore and Waiting River High School, which was basically our graduating class was 200 people. Uh, it was actually 201. And um, we knew everybody. So you knew everybody in the town um, and, you know, while their comings, comings and goings. Um, one last thing I'll reiterate here is um, one of the things that kind of stands true uh, in families is that everybody is totally different. And uh, we have some similarities, sure, but it's okay to have different interests and in the people around you. And um, the picture at the bottom, those are my siblings. So um, there's myself right there. Um, I obviously went into science. Uh, my brother, who is the only math brain, uh, that I will forever contact when I panic over math stuff. Uh, he became an actuary, which is basically a person who um, analyzes risk and um, usually works in places like the healthcare field and stuff to literally do math all day and figure out rates and potential changes and all that stuff. My sister uh, went a totally different direction. She became a federal probation officer um, and she, uh, her, her major hub is in uh, New York City. And then finally, I have my youngest sister, my half sister, who's still a student. So we were totally different um, and took completely different paths, but um, all found our way through our interests and, and through support, you know, with our parents and, and, and whatnot. Next slide, please. So uh, my educational career uh, beyond high school, um, I had a few false starts. I started at one college on Long Island and um, it closed actually. Uh, it was actually really cool. It was built from an old Vanderbilt mansion, um, but it, it wasn't able to sustain itself. And so that happened. And um, finally I, I ended up settling on coming down to Florida 
I needed a change. I needed some separation from where I grew up. And so I went and I did my bachelor's in earth science uh, education. Um, but what I quickly, quickly realized after I graduated is I had no idea what I, I mean, in earth science, what I, I didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated. I just graduated, had this earth science degree, knew that was my interest, but I literally didn't know what the next step was. And, um, so what did I do? I just started applying to literally anything that had to do with earth science, just applying everywhere. Cause I figured if I got my foot in the door uh, at any organization that might give me a, a better idea of where I saw myself, you know, you know, moving down the career path in the future. And so I did apply to two different positions uh, in particular, one being with Underwriter Laboratories, which is if you've ever looked on any product, it says UL in a little circle. Um, what they do is all different kinds of product testing, but sometimes that can lead into, um, you know, the environmental and earth science track as well, because there are products that they need to uh, ensure are environmentally safe. I went through the whole process. They interviewed me. They said, okay, we're gonna fly you out to the headquarters. I was very hesitant because I would have been living in the middle of the country where there was nothing. And um, so I said, all right, well, you know, while I'm planning to do that, I'm gonna keep applying. And so I applied to a teaching position and I was like, hmm, you know, maybe. So I interviewed. And what I did not know at the time is I was interviewing for a position. Uh, it was on the, the Homestead, Florida city border. Uh, and if you know that area, um, there's a lot of issues like socioeconomic issues, et cetera. And um, in consequence, there's a lot of gang activity and violence. And that basically, I guess, uh, you know, went into the schools as well. So here I was, uh, really fresh from college. I had no idea what to do. I went to interview at this teaching position and the lady was very nice. She said, we'll get back to you. I walked out of the building and she, all of a sudden I hear my name and um, there's this little lady running in high heels down the sidewalk behind me. And she said, you, you got the position. When can you start? We really need you to start because we lost a teacher and I started the next week. So I ended up not going to underwriter laboratories and I started teaching. Um, it was a complete like experience where I had no idea um, what to expect and I was kind of thrown into it. I had never gone through educational training um, and you just learn to adapt really quickly. <laughs> Uh, but actually that job changed everything because despite all of the problems, the fights, the violence, um, many issues that was going on in the school at the time, I fell in love with my students and teaching and, and having those aha moments with them. And um, I learned to, you know, basically see them as every year I had 150 children um, and it really changed a lot. And so I decided to continue on that uh, educational path. So if you're involved or wanting to be involved in education uh, in Florida, it's drastically needed right now. It's greatly needed. Um, and there are some alternative paths you can take. You do not have to uh, be or have a, a bachelor's in education. You, as long as you have a bachelor's in a subject area that is, um, you know, has to do with what you're teaching, you can go on an alternative path, which gets you the steps you need to get your full educator certification um, by taking some extra courses on top of your degree. And you can teach for the first two years while you're working on those things. So uh, it is like a really solid start to a career where maybe you weren't sure what you were going to do, but um, you know, you know, you want to do something impactful for, for the community. So I decided, I got this job. Um, I decided, okay, I'm going to go for my master's. I'm going to do that in science education because I know I'm going to be in the education field somewhere. Um, and then um, I ended up moving up to West Palm Beach and um, finished my uh, degree in my MS and FIU by driving once a week down to Miami in the middle of traffic. And um, I started working at some schools up here in West Palm. And so through that track, I knew, okay, I'm still gonna be involved in education, but I want to do 
more. And I think eventually I want to teach at the college level. So I knew for that I needed more educational credentials. And so what I did is, um, again, I just applied for whatever I could. So uh, there was a position opening at North Campus in the um, science department for geology, I applied. I wasn't really educationally credentialed for it, but I said, you know what, it's an experience to see what, you know, what could be done, right? So I applied, I interviewed, I went through the teaching interview and they said, you know, we're not going with you. You're not gonna be, however, two people, um, who actually one person is still here with us, um, Susie Connors. She's in the science department now in Central. Um, and um, they saw something in, in me in, in, in terms of my uh, desire to you know, educate and, and in the classroom, what kind of things I did. So um, I ended up getting an adjunct position with Broward College. And I did that for a few years at night where I would adjunct classes at night and during the summers while I went for my second master's, which would lead to my current track and my PhD. So you can go to the, oh, thank you. You can go to the next um, slide, please. So, um, so in that progress, uh, one of the things that's important to know is my whole family is still back in New York. And so I knew I had to work. Um, I just had to. And I, I think that's true of many students today that we need the money to survive. We need to pay rent. We need to pay our other bills. And so all of this education I did while I was already teaching. And so I spent three years at a private school. I spent three years at um, a middle school. And then finally, um, at the end of the three years at Eagles Landing Middle in Boca, um, that's when I had the educational credentials needed in order to teach at Broward College. And so I applied again. Now I applied again everywhere because Broward College had two positions and Miami-Dade College had a position and Palm Beach State College had a position, all in geology and geosciences. So if you're interested in science, know that that field, um, there's not that many people go for geology, earth science, oceanography. And so there's a lot of job availability if you know what track you're kind of headed on. And so I applied everywhere. I was interviewing everywhere. I got into a car accident and ended up um, having to drive around a rental and I was interviewing remotely, sitting in the back of the rental, just anywhere, you know, while I was working, trying to fit in everything. And it ended up being that I got the position um, at, at Broward College, you know, as a result. And I'll tell you, there's like three or four, well, there's many times in education that I cried my eyes out, but there's three or four times that were so impactful and I remember crying my eyes out. The first was um, when I was going for, um, to, to join the PhD program. One of the steps you'll have to take as a student is you will have to take, take what we call a GRE. And depending, you might have to do that for your master's, but a GRE is basically a test uh, that has an ELA component and a math component. And it takes hours. And it's like one of those things like when you took your SAT. Um, the morning of it, I knew I needed a certain score. The morning of it, um, I stood in the shower and I gave myself a pep talk and I was like, I can do this. I can do this, I can. I went and took the exam. I, I got the score I needed because it tells you like roughly right away. And I burst out to tears in the middle of the testing center because I put so much pressure on myself to do well on it um, that I just like couldn't handle the emotions in these testing center people were like, something's wrong with this girl. We got to get her out of here. So uh, the next is actually when I started my PhD program. And I want to tell you as a student, sometimes um, you feel inadequate. It's just the way it is. You think that everybody else in the room is smarter than you. And if you haven't experienced that yet, someday in your life in some way that's definitely probably a very common human experience and the first day of my of my phd program we were in this orientation everybody talked about their research i went home and i cried my eyes out because i said everybody's smarter than me everybody knows everything already i have no idea what i'm doing i can i do this and some really great people gave me the pep talk like you gotta chill a little bit um and so i kept going and then the last is when I got my job at Broward College, it was a long road. I had interviewed previously. 
Uh, it's when you go into education, sometimes the process takes months um, because they have to go through hiring committees, et cetera, et cetera. And so I got the position. I hung up the phone with Dr. Uh, Bartolucci. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, I got, uh, you know, got off the phone with Dr. Bartolucci and he told me, you know, you got the position. And at this time I had been married at this point and I cried my eyes out again. <laughs> So all these times, there are experiences that I hold very near and dear to my heart because it feels like steps where you finally made it and it's okay to be emotional and it's okay to support, get the support from the people around you. You can go on to the next. Thank you. So uh, one of the things that I always say is to say yes to everything. Um, when I worked at that private school, we had to learn stupid dances and wear costumes a lot. Uh, I said yes, even though that's not really my thing. Um, but also on the educational and professional side, I said yes to everything as well. So that means micro-credentialing. Um, when I was a full-time educator in K-12, I got certifications in Google Education and Microsoft Education. I would go to conferences whenever I could. So I joined the NSTA, which is the National Science Teachers Association, and I would find funding. So because I, you know, again, I'm trying to support myself and, and, and survive. Um, I would find funding, whether it be from educational institutions, uh, you know, whatever I could do um, to make it to these conferences. And at those conferences, you can get micro-credentialed in things. So for example, NASA had an outreach program where you would take their workshop, you go through their certification process. And now several times, three times already, but many more times in the future, I can borrow materials from, um, from NASA. So I can borrow lunar specimens, um, meteorite specimens, all sorts of stuff that come in a really crazy metal box that there's a lot of security involved. Um, but it's just something I did because I went through that micro-credentialing. In addition, throughout that whole process of teaching, I went through the teacher certification steps. Again, I mentioned you can go through an alternate route if that's what you choose to do. Um, during my graduate studies, I looked around to see what other things could I, you know, get a certificate in. So I knew a lot of the courses I was already taking were in GIS, which is called Geographic Information Systems, which is using satellite data to learn about the world. And so I said, well, am I going to have enough credits to get this graduate certification. I only had to take one more course than I was already planning to take. And I got a graduate certificate in it. So now in addition to my degrees, you have some cert certifications on top of that. So what is this beneficial for? Resume building, networking opportunities if you go to these conferences and also through professional development, you learn new ways to implement whatever practices, you know, you 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 you're working on so i learned new ways to teach in the classroom i when i was in the private school i had to teach a stem class well i turned that into like different science topic a week one week we were doing experiments with bugs another week we were dissecting you know uh sharks another week like all sorts of different stuff that i would never have known about if i hadn't gone to the conferences to learn next uh slide please So um, throughout my educational pursuits, uh, one cool thing if you become a teacher is uh, during the summer, you have a little more time. And I'm not saying you have summers off, you do a lot of stuff in the summer, but you have a little more time during the summer to take on other professional development opportunities and things. So as part of my uh, geosciences masters, I did get a graduate research assistantship in which I was working with a wonderful person, Dr. Matova at FAU, and um, she was working on a major NSF grant, um, which uh, really was across like five colleges, uh, a bunch of people were working together. And um, through that, uh, we learned, I had to compile a lot of GIS data um, because we were learning about how um, utilities and like major stakeholders in hurricane relief efforts, so like the electric company, the water people, whatever, how uh, to help facilitate bridging gaps in communication when these major hurricane events took place. So I hadn't really like nobody telling me 
how to do these things, like in terms of like, how do you get a graduate research assistantship? Um, so I asked, and that's really what you need to do. You need to go to your professor and you need to say, hey, is there an opportunity for me somewhere if I'm really interested in this? And so I literally asked Dr. Mitsova and she said, you know what? We have a position this summer, uh, let's figure it out. And, and we did. We can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, and so what am I currently working on in my PhD? Well, I finished all my coursework. It's a steady uphill battle, let me tell you. Um, but right now I'm working on my dissertation. And so in this research, we focus on natural disasters, um, but specifically I'm focusing on um, electrical outages. And so this data right here on the right uh, is GIS data. And actually it's a satellite that goes over, it's called NASA black marble data. It's a satellite that zips over the earth every night uh, or continuously, but every night it will take a picture at midnight uh, of different locations. And um, what you're seeing is nighttime lights. Um, so cities and stuff and how bright it is. And so I'm looking at from natural disasters, uh, what types of impacts are disadvantaged socioeconomic groups facing in mostly in terms of electrical outages in comparison to other socioeconomic classes. This includes recovery rates um, and also um, uh, what type of hurdles people are experiencing or having to overcome um, following natural disasters that occur. Because we've seen throughout time, you know, you've seen it, things like Hurricane Katrina, where 80% of the, you know, city was underwater uh, in New Orleans. And um, most of the people that were most negatively affected uh, were people who were disadvantaged socioeconomically. Same thing in Puerto Rico. They didn't have power for a year after Hurricane Maria in many areas. Um, but the poorest of the poor were those who experienced the worst of the of the impacts, unfortunately. So hopefully this will be done soon. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's a, pro a work in progress. Uh, next slide, please. So what do I teach at Broward College? So I teach across all of the natural sciences really um, Oopsie. Um, so earth science and earth science lab, environmental science, geology, oceanography, and for the bachelor's program in environmental science, which if you're interested in um, the environmental science bachelor's program, that's a way to get a four-year degree at an affordable rate through Broward College. Um, you can um, reach out. Uh, Dr. Serrano is the, the person in charge of that. And um, I, I'm going to be teaching EBR 1261 next semester, which is about air pollution specifically. Other roles I have at the college, I'm a faculty senator. Again, say yes to everything. Join what you can when you can. It'll help you in the long run. Um, and I was a course developer for three courses uh, during this whole COVID experience uh, on the online college. So if you opt to take ESC online, the lab online, or environmental science online starting next semester, uh, the coursework would, would have been something I developed. And then I'm also involved in whatever committee I can be on. So if somebody says, hi, we're doing a committee for XYZ, I usually say yes, as long as I don't have something else. Um, because again, you learn from other people, you learn from these experiences, and it just will make you a more well-rounded person in the future. Uh, last slide, I think. Um, again, if you have any questions, especially if you want to know a little bit more about the courses that I teach, whether it be oceanography, geology, or environmental, or earth science, whatever, please reach out to me. My email is rclark2. I always say the way to remember that is that I am the second most important rclark on campus. And um, I'm located in Building 7, Office 119. It's the corner. It's not a, it's a corner office. It's not as cool as you think, but it's, it's, it's a nice spot facing Dunkin' Donuts if you don't know where to go. Thank you, Mrs. Clark, for your inspirational story. Like Yesenia said in the chat, um, you are very inspiring and she lo loves your drive. So oh, if you thank didn't you get so a much. chance to see that, I'm reiterating it for her. Um, Yesenia also asked what courses you teach. So I'm just gonna go back to the previous slide. So these are all the courses that Mrs. Clark does teach on Central Campus. So any of the earth sciences, environmental, geology, oceanography, and the one she just mentioned, which is on air pollution. 
You're Thank welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so if you would like to email Mrs. Clark directly, this is her email, rclark2 at broward.edu, and her office is Building 7 on Central Campus, office number 119. So again, if you have any questions that you would like answered during our Q&A session, you can place them in the chat and I will record them while our next speaker, Dr. Benush Mamari, will be presenting. So Dr. Benush Mamari received both her Master of Science in Chemistry and Doctorate in Forensic Analytical Chemistry from Florida International University. Dr. Mamari has co-authored lab manuals for chemistry and organic chemistry, developed online blended and remote chemistry courses, as a media and textbook reviewer, a winner of numerous mini grants and awards, including Professor of the Year in 2006 and 2019, and endowed teaching chair in 2008 and 2013. Dr. Mamari has also served as Associate Dean for the Physical Science and Wellness Department at the Central Camp campus from 2011 to 2013, and she is now one of our senior professors of chemistry at Broward College's Central Campus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Mamari, for sharing your journey with us, and you can take it away. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Orich, for the nice introduction, and I uh, really appreciate the time of uh, everyone who attended this informative uh, uh, meeting, and I'm excited to, um, to be here. Um, you can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, I was born and raised in, uh, in Iran. Iran is a beautiful country with four seasons, uh, lots of mountains, deserts, and most importantly, one of the best places for good food. Um, I went to, uh, so my elementary school, actually, um, in Iran, I was in a small uh, area in a village where my parents, they had their farm. Um, that school had only two classrooms. And I think everybody who has presented and said like small community, I think I break the record uh, so far. Uh, the two classrooms, one of them was shared for first grade, second grade, and third grade, and the other classroom was shared for fourth grade and fifth grade, so we were getting like half time of teaching if there was any. So any, uh, uh, then I, um, but it was, it was a great time because during elementary school, I was, uh, I had my parents on my side, I had their love, I had the warm and hot food, uh, but uh, I enjoyed the, my parents at their beautiful farm that they had. Uh, for, uh, to continue school, I had to move to a nearby city uh, and uh, with my siblings, sometimes two of them, two of us or three of us um, together at age 12. And by age 13, I was actually the older siblings responsible for other, um, others. And uh, we couldn't wait for summer to come to go back to my parents for their, you know, their love and their attention. The love is always there, but their attention and good food. So uh, for my elementary class, I was the only one who actually got the high school diploma. I was the only girl, I should say, who got the, the high school uh, diploma. And then I was accepted to university with my dream major. My dream was chemistry because I was inspired by my high school chemistry teacher. I really enjoyed you know, um, her classes and I decided to go with my, that was my first choice. So I took the entrance exam in, in Iran based on your grade, based on your score, you can choose like different majors. I, my first choice was chemistry and I got accepted to that. I had other choices uh, like my priority, like 10th and 11th, I was a pharmacy and, and medical school, which I didn't know that my score was high enough to get accepted, but surprisingly I got accepted, but you, you have to continue with your first choice. And I, that was my first choice actually. So I got my uh, degree in uh, my bachelor's in, in Iran. Um, with um, chemistry. Um, I showed so much love and enthusiasm and uh, attention to chemistry that 
uh, the day that I graduated from my, uh, with my bachelor's, my professor actually told me, you know what, I have a job for you. I said, really? It's very, very nice and exciting. So he took me to this um, uh, factory that he knew and uh, we went there. He said, I, he told them that I have a gift for you. I said, oh my God, it's like, it's overwhelming. If the day you graduate, you are introduced like that to a bunch of people who want to hire you. It was, it was overwhelming. So anyway, they interviewed, they had the interview and during the interview, they asked me, okay, what do you want to do? When can you start? I said, if the interview goes well, and if I'm accepted, I will, I, I can start right after. And they said, okay, there is a lab coat right there hanging, brand new lab coat. And I actually went and I took that lab coat, I put on and I start my job. At that point, that was my dream job. In Iran, when you take like major, your major in chemistry, you have three options, teaching, chemistry, you have the option for going with, um, studying pure chemistry or applied chemistry. I chose applied chemistry because I wanted to work in industry. That was my dream job then. Uh, it didn't last long, I should, I will tell you this, um, but um, that's how I started my, my job in Iran and I graduated with my bachelor's. Um, then I, I got, I changed jobs and then I moved to, um, to Florida. Like moving to state, it was not the plan for me. I didn't plan on moving to states. I, I didn't plan on, on um, you know, coming this far because I was always living too far from my parents. And it was challenging at the time. And it is like thinking about it now, it, it must be very challenging, but it's, that's how I, I think I grew up and I, um, I, it made me a little bit more stronger um, for, you know, and I do have, sympathy and for, for anyone that I know that they are going through the similar similar situation, not at that age, but still. Uh, the school that I was accepted for university, it was far from home because uh, to drive there, to, to take the bus, it took me 24 hours. Uh, to take the plane, it took like two days because there was not, no direct flight from that city to where my parents live. I had to change like two flights and it was like one flight per day per, you know, that location. So I, that, that's why it wasn't my plan to come to US, but if the crown fits, right? Uh, I, as I was working at the university, I was introduced to my husband who at that point was Iranian, but American citizen by the dean of the college. And he was back home and he was trying to get married, looking for the right person, they introduced me and then I, I moved to Florida. So you can go to the next slide, that's how I'm in Florida. And these are the only two places actually that I actually lived. Uh, my uh, bachelor's degree I got from the Ferdowsi University of Mashhad, beautiful place, beautiful uh, department and the professors, they were all, very good professors that they impacted so much. They had so much impact on my life and learning chemistry. Learning chemistry or being a chemistry major in Iran, it's slightly different from the US because I had to take 146 credits to get my bachelor, 26 gen ed, and that included math, biology, physics, and everything. So I had like 110 plus, uh, chemistry courses that includes like four inorganic chemistry, two general chemistry, four organic chemistry, advanced organic chemistry, and many more. So I graduated there and I came to um, US. When I came to US that first week, I found FIU, Florida International University, because I lived in Miami then. Um, so I went and I made my way to Dr. Burton's office, who at that point was the graduate director. He, uh, he talked to me and for me, like speaking like that first week that I moved to US because we don't speak English in Iran, we speak Farsi. And uh, when I came here with the broken English that I had, but I was very brave, I think. Uh, I said, I I'm looking for jobs. He says, what do you wanna do? I said, I want to work in the lab I want to teach because in Iran, I was teaching in the university for, for two years. So I said, 
that's what I want to do here, continue. He said, okay, go talk to Dr. Keller and tell Dr. Keller that I want to be an adjunct. I said, what? Because that day I didn't know what adjunct means. So he took a piece of paper and said, wrote adjunct. He said, go Dr. Keller and say you want to be adjunct. So he showed me the paper. I went, I wrote to Dr. Keller. Dr. Keller, I want to be an adjunct in, you know, for the department. And he says, okay, uh, sit down. And I sit down there and says, okay, we are doing this, this, week, this experiment about uh, reactions of alcohol. So uh, chemistry students, especially organic chemistry students, they understand this now. They said the experiment is like Lucas test. And I sit down there and I sweat and I try my best and I say, okay, organic, uh, the alcohols, if you have a tertiary alcohol, it's going to give tertiary carbocation, it's very stable. And then secondary is less stable, so it take longer time and uh, the primary is not going to happen and all that. And I said, we are using separated funnel and I was just shaking like this, the separated funnel right there in his office, like imagining. And he says, he stopped and he said, listen, you have your chemistry. There's no doubt, but you have to improve your English. I said, but you don't know me. And he starts laughing. Yes, I don't know you because you've been just here for five minutes. How would I know you? Like 10 minutes, I said, but I will practice. I would stand in front of the mirror and I will practice my lesson. I, I will prepare myself. He said, you have an option. You can do volunteer. And I said, what? Because at that point, I didn't know what volunteer means. And he said, well, you do work. You don't get paid but it's good for you. I said, really, uh, I would take that. So I took the volunteering job at the uh, at FIU uh, Organic Chemistry Lab as my first volunteering or first opportunity. And uh, after one semester, I actually got a, a teaching position as an adjunct that I, I wanted at, the, um, at FIU. And then I was um, hired full-time at uh, that, that volunteering job actually helped me to get a job at uh, Miami Dade. Uh, Miami Dade College hired me as a full time um, instructor and a lab manager. And then I got the um, actually, I got to teach classes full time, five classes, and I was managed, managing the lab. Um, I was taking classes as a special student because at that point, just like uh, Professor Clark said, I, need to, I needed to um, study for GRE, study for TOEFL, um, and uh, pass those exams before I could go to the master's degree. So it took some time before I can get into the master's degree. So I had to take the, the, the like special classes. And um, classes at special student, you correct that. So, um, I was able to then get admission for the master's while uh, and um, study and graduate with my master's degree at FIU while working full time at IMA Day. Then uh, the day that I was graduating with my master's, I had my dissertation, uh, my thesis um, defense, and I found that day that I'm pregnant with my second child. Then I, I stopped school, I took a break, I went back 2003 um, to to um, FIU back again to Dr. Ferson for my, for my PhD. 2003 was like one of the best years in my life because that year I got actually accepted to back to FIU for a PhD and I got hired by Broward College for a full-time faculty position. And that's, that was like one of the best uh, things that could happen to me. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, what I did in Iran uh, or before coming to Florida, I was hired by the factory the day of my graduation, as I said, by, recommended by professor, and uh, it was it was industry. I didn't I I was very excited the first day. I didn't like it. I didn't love it. The second week, I said, Oh, oh my God, what I'm going to do here? So I found another job because then I had like. I had a two shift job, not that I needed the money because one would have been enough to live because I was by myself. And then, uh, then I, was, uh, I got the other job. I, I was saying, okay, maybe I go to food industry and maybe I love that more because um, I was comparing, I was studying, I was working on myself. This was my dream job. I study applied chemistry. What should I do now? I didn't, I didn't love it. So, and I couldn't, stay 
at the job that I did not like. I'm not saying industry is bad for others, but it didn't fit my my personality. I wanted a place like a you know academic environment that the sky is limit for anyone. You can you can study, you can earn your degrees, you can earn your professional um, titles, like as many as you want, as far as you want. You can you can achieve all your your dreams. There is not much of competition. There is not much of like backstabbing. Everybody is there to help you to move on and uh, achieve your your dream. You get help from your um, colleagues, you get help from your, your dean, you get help from your associate dean, everybody is there to, uh, to help you to, to move on. They are in the education business. They are in education business, so they are not in business. In industry, maybe I was not lucky or it was meant to be because I'm happier, much happier now that there was like a limited number of staff that they were there and like big competition, there was already decided who is going to be the boss and who's going to rule and who's going to be the first one whenever there is a conversation. So when I got the job at the, the University of Azad University of Sabzabur and I was teaching and I managing the lab, I improved their labs. I expand the lab from one lab to two labs. Then they had like two separate labs. They had the organic and general chemistry separate labs. And also I wrote a lab manual for them because they had to use a book and it was like an old book and it was very good for students that, you know, we can do better. So I wrote the lab manual. In my lab manual for experiments, I included everything Stephen needed in one place. So the safe, the lab safe, the lab technique, the introduction part, the procedure, everything was part of one experiment. So it saved and lab manual was much cheaper, like one fourth of the price of the book that they had to buy. And it was much appreciated by students. Um, I don't know about, of course, the department was very supportive, but students, they loved it. And it was, that was the payback for me. I mean, students, they actually liked that because they didn't have to spend too much time. I saved money for students and I, I saved the, um, the time for students because they didn't have to research because I did demand like lab lab report. That was the, the curriculum. It wasn't me. But for the lab report, they didn't have to go different places. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So at the school for my master's degree, my title of my um, research was based on precision and accuracy of intoxilizer 5000. What is intoxilizer 5000 is basically breath alcohol analyzer. I already told you that I took enough chemistry classes. For it. And then uh, with that many chemistry classes that I had, I, I passed the, the, the placement test for physical chemistry. I passed the placement test for organic chemistry. I only took the classes that I needed for my later for teaching or to help me with the research was like more of a mass spectroscopy and other advanced techniques that I didn't have or it was not the topic when I was getting my bat my my bachelor's so that was my um, my um, research and basically I was I was defending people who might have by false accused of having high uh, breath alcohol concentration that they could have been arrested because other compounds, if they were working in the, in the garage or they were working with like certain chemicals in lab, um, they could have, their breath can show high concentration of alcohol and that is not true and it was not fair. So I had to, to study and that was my, my um, thesis um, title. And I really enjoyed it at that time, actually. I'm not saying, I mean, for, for me, like, not drinking alcohol and defending people who did drink some, uh, it was uh, it was nice. And the forensic area actually was it was great. I really liked that that uh, the um, the field also. So I like the field of forensic. And next slide, please. Um, um, when I went back for my dissertation for for PhD, uh, my dissertation title also was like forensic major. So I, I majored in forensic analytical chemistry again. 
because I was trying to spread my wings. I was trying to see like what other opportunities, maybe I didn't like the industry in Iran, maybe I like it here. And uh, when I um, did my research, uh, my research topic, let me finish this part first. After like attending like so many conferences, after getting my PhD in forensic also, uh, my top choice was education even though I had a choice to work for as a, you know, in the medical examiner's office in a crime lab or in the, uh, for FDA, uh, because my advisor knew like so many people that he can actually recommend me um, and he would have, or he did offer, but education was my priority. I wanted to stay at Broward College. I wanted to teach at, at Broward College. The topic for my dissertation was determining time of death. Time of death is the, the time that the victim drew his last breath. So prior to that, the, they were using like flies and they still use flies, which is not very accurate. If there is rain, there is wind, it can be affected. Um, then uh, the, the sample that I used was human heart sample. Human heart sample is a, is a heart, is a protected organ. So it's not going to be affected by the wind and by the rain and by you know, other like routine um, environmental factors. And it is so protected that it can be used actually for, for more dependable um, data. Uh, and I chose troponin T as the protein and my thesis was based on degradation of that protein because I knew that troponin I, which is a smaller protein compared to troponin T, would degradate and it's used now at the, at the hospitals, at the emergency room to test for heart attack. And uh, one of my, my advisor actually was the, who, who got the, the copyright for it, or I don't remember the term, what he got, but he, he, he has the license um, because he's a student and they worked together, they came up with the idea from FIU. So uh, troponin I would disappear like within three days from your blood. So if, if, you, if someone has a heart attack, it would get into your blood and it would disappear in three days. So that would give us estimation of like three days time of death. And that was not enough. I was looking for longer time. Troponin I degradation takes 14 days. So that would have been much better estimation of the time of death. And it helps the medical examiners. It helps, you know, it, it's an excuse or, or, or defend many suspects. So the research that I had, it was not easy, but I did enjoy it. Um, the reason it wasn't easy because I had to collect my samples for 28 days. If anything went wrong or if I missed a day, that would have been like valid. Uh, sampling. And when I start my, my research, my actual reaction uh, from the time I start until it finished, it took 18 hours. So I had to plan my days. I had to, um, I had to go like sometimes uh, it had to be uh, during the weekend because during the week I was teaching full time. Uh, and at that time I was at North Campus. I would go to FIU once a day and sometimes two times a day, but I couldn't do experiments. I would just do like sample collection or taking something from putting another place. But my experiments actually took long. So I go like, I leave home five o'clock in the morning on Saturday, I come back to 3 a.m. on Sunday and uh, I called the security, um, you know, campus safety and they knew already who's calling, what's my location. So they didn't have to ask too many questions because they were used to that. Uh, and the medical, the chemical that I was using is called Mercaptor. Mercaptor denatures the protein. And when it does uh, denature the protein, it, it also smells really bad. So I wanted to do it during the weekend, which other, my, uh, my group members, they were not there. And it would leave Mark like 24 to 48 hours. Other chemists, they have experienced other nasty chemicals, but my my mark was that, that sometimes I heard actually one morning of Monday, my group members walked in and says, oh, the Mercato lady was here. So that was my, my mark that they knew that if, if the lab smells like Mercato, I must have been there before. So I got two awards for that research, 
one actually was on red carpet. I really enjoy that. Uh, was the, the second one, the first one, uh, which was just at the, we had a poster contest at the Nova uh, University. And um, it was in the, during the forensic conference of 2007. I got the first place. And my second award was um, the, it was for emerging uh, forensic scientist award, which is like emerging science and technology together. It was a big deal for forensic environment to be able to estimate the time of death back uh, to like 14 days. It was very important for them. Thank you, next slide. Okay. I've traveled a lot. I have traveled North America, South America, Asia, uh, Middle East. You see that I've, uh, I've taught at different places in Florida and international centers that we have in uh, Bolivia and in, in um, India, Mumbai, um, India. And what I actually like that, that experience of teaching in different places because I got to, to see a lot, meet and meet different people, people with different culture, different ethnicity. I work with them and I was uh, doing my own travels and conferences that I attend plus the teaching experience that I had different places. And uh, I, have, uh, I have respect for people uh, with different, uh, different ethnicity and different uh, culture. I have respect for my, uh, for my students. I have respect for them because I did not go to school everything being ready for me. I didn't, I was 12 when I left my mom, you know, I was only home during the summer. So I have respect for students that they go through similar, similar um, situation. I'm a lifelong uh, learner. I got my degrees when I was adult. I was, I got my degree, my master's degree when I was, don't remember how, how old I was, but my PhD, I know was 40. I got it because I told my advisor, you know what? Since you were so nice and you accept, accepted like part-time student, because that was like a big challenge for FIU to accept part-time chemistry students. They didn't want to accept. And I went to my, my advisor. I was getting a, ref, a reference letter from my professor to, for, to be hired at Broward College. And he wrote me a letter and said this. Uh, he, and he said, OK, can you re review it before I sign it? As I was reading the 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 letter, and my mind was working on somewhere else. And I said, Dr. Ferton, if you believe in me and you write this, this letter, why I'm not in your program? And he says, what program? I said, my application for a PhD has been sitting in the graduate office for, for 18 months. And he was, he was uh, actually, he was in the, uh, um, he was a dean, associate dean at that point. He called, and my application got processed, and I was accepted to the um, to the university um, at that point for the for the PhD program. So um, he gave me the letter, so I was accepted to the to the. Uh, I got the job at the Broward College North Campus. I was hired to teach organic chemistry. I did teach organic chemistry only for for I was the only one teaching organic chemistry at that campus for six years. We start, I started with, the with one class with 17 students. I end up with, with uh, like three different classes, with full class. And I was so excited after three days that the registration was open, the class was full. I missed those days. So anyway, and then I moved to, uh, to the central campus and I'm teaching all these, uh, all chemistries and the labs. And, 1032. The only one that I don't teach is 1025. So my students, if they want to register for any of these classes, um, please uh, feel free and, and register for these classes for me. Um, the reason I, I said I have respect for the students, you can go to the next because um, of the time. Um, it's my life experience of learning uh, as I was getting my master's and PhD, I was taking care of my house, my, my husband, and raising two beautiful children. When I graduated, then I, I, was with, I was watching my children to study. My son is a medical school 
student now, he is in medical school, and I know that GPA is very important for students. And I understood that because he was, when he was applying for medical school, GPA was very important. At the same time, I understand that my students also need understanding of the material and understanding of chemistry is not going to be easy unless you have some fun. I get very excited with chemistry. These are all the, the images that you see. Those are actually the real images. Those are my students watching me doing some, you know, magic of chemistry outside. My, my daughter, when she was preparing for his DAT exam, I witnessed how deep learning is important for, for students. So when they want to take the MCAT, they want to take the PCAT, they want to take other CATs, they are ready. So they just, just don't memorize. So I want to make sure that I do, uh, you know, my, I fulfill my responsibility to help the students to learn and make it, uh, at the same time, make it fun. It doesn't have to be challenging all the time, but it does require like learning deep learning so they can uh, succeed in the, in the future uh, when, whenever they want to take their, their um, entrance exams and move on. So it shows that it's possible to have fun with, with chemistry. Again, this, all the images are in, in, some of them are inside the classroom. Some of them are in the hallway of the, the science department. Others are like outside to have fun. Uh, with chemistry. While I was at the uh, central campus, as the introduction said that I was uh, a couple of years, I was the associate dean. So I know I was exposed to like problems that students could have, faculties could have. So I understand my students more. That's, that helps me. I did develop the, the, the lab manuals to make it affordable and to make manageable for students. For my lectures also, I do the same. And all I can say that I, I love what I'm doing. Teaching is my passion. And for any of my students who want to, to take any of these classes or pursue this uh, uh, job, it's uh, one of the, the, or the most rewarding job at least in my opinion, because you could see your students grow. You get the feedback from them and you could see them grow over the, over the time. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, it, it was great for me to be able to talk and to my students who are future students and great for students to hear uh, the other professors. I am um, grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mamari, for your inspirational story as well. And I, through these pictures, I can see the joy that you have sharing chemistry with all, all of your students. So I'm sure those who are in attendance feel that as well. So you. you're welcome. So we have actually met the 1230 mark. If you have to go, we understand, but I do have three questions for the panelists. And if you're able to stay on, you can do so. But if you have to leave, we're actually going to email the recording to everyone who registered so you can have access to it later on. Um, I believe um, Mrs. Clark had to go because she actually has to teach on campus. So she's- I have like five minutes if there's any specific question for me. Okay, so that's great. Cause I will give you the first question. Um, and let me stop sharing so we can, very good. So my question for you is, what is your best advice you would give to students who have to work while going to school? Because you, you shared all the different teaching positions that you have, but I know there's some difficulty while going to school. So what's your advice? So um, don't, I mean, for one, to be totally frank, uh, don't expect it to be easy in the first, um, you know, from the get-go. Uh, I think it's mostly about time management and organization of your time and, and your tasks. What I would do is um, each day I would schedule or, or write myself a list of exactly what I needed to be done with for that day. So if that meant, okay, I'm going to, to work for this time, but then for X number of hours afterwards, I'm going to be working on this task. Um, 
I'm not going to lie. I gave up a lot of weekends, a lot of weekends uh, to accomplish tasks, especially when I was going through my master's programs. Um, because uh, sometimes there's just not enough time in the day and, and you have to push into time that you would otherwise like to um, use, you know. And then finally, what I would say is to surround yourself, hopefully by people that are understanding. Um, I told my husband just literally a couple of days ago that I appreciate so much the type of person he is for understanding that I always had to put a lot of time into my career. Um, he knows like, okay, this day I'm going to be working on this all day. So stay out of my hair. Um, and he has never complained, not one time in the 10 years or 11, almost 11 years now that we've been together, he's never complained one time um, about me having to dedicate my time, which I appreciate so much. So if you are in a relationship or with friends that can't understand that and don't understand that it's really important to you to advance in your career or advance educationally, then you're not surrounding yourself by, by the right people. Um, I, I hope that that makes sense. <laughs> um, very quickly, Yesenia would like to know, it's kind of a personal question, but kind of related because of support, et cetera. Do you have any children? Uh, right now, I only have my husband and then I have uh, fur babies. So <laughs> I have my cats. Um, believe it or not, one of the ways that I got through um, education and, and the, my early career is making a plan for five to 10 years, knowing like sort of where I'm going to end up. So it's it actually in my two-year plan to maybe have a kid, but not today. I got to finish my doctor first. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, and that actually leads me to Dr. Mamari because you mentioned support of family members, right? And for you, Rebecca, it was your husband. Now, I know, Benush, while you spoke, you did mention that you had a child and you did yes. take a break. I remember when I was doing my last year of my PhD, I actually became a single mother. And during that time, you become kind of, you can become deflated if you don't have that support. So because I had my family to help me, I was able to push through and complete it, right? So you when, you, when you, you became- definitely, Yes, I wanted to also say that I am grateful that Broward College also supported and helped me during the time that I was going to school. My schedule was very flexible. My associate dean one, uh, allowed me to finish my classes, pick my classes like morning, morning time. So in the afternoon, I could go to university for my research and also home. My, my, my husband was very supportive as well. So some of our students may not have that strong support should one of the females or even the males whose girlfriend becomes pregnant and they have to pause to take care of their family. Where did you get the inspiration to get back into that schooling me mentality? That's for me, right? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, one of the good things about there's like the student lingo, there is like a, there is like a um, certification that students then they, they, can, they can earn. Broward College actually, actually uh, supports that or they have, they is provided on the on B2L is like is time management. I mean, you have to you have to love what you are doing. At the same time, you have to be able to manage your your time. Uh, as there were times that I didn't see my children for like two three days in a row, because when I was coming home, they were asleep. I was I had to leave the house, but I had to get help. I had to get help. My husband could you know was helping me at the same time. You know I had to get a babysitter to to watch them while he was at work so it was uh, it's it is challenging but i uh, none of this is easy but it is doable i always tell my students that learning like chemistry that some people they might say oh chemistry i mean there was no other job that you could do like teaching mm -hmm. chemistry that's the most challenging i i don't agree with that it's it is doable and i have, i'm confident that students they can they can do it I mean, the students who are in college, 
they already have like their I had my my organic chemistry back in uh, 1988. He told me one thing that is still it stays with me. He says that average, uh, like if someone has like very low IQ, you try like one thing to memorize it like for seven times, you can do it. So if you are already in university, your your IQ is much higher than average. So if you are in school already, that you've done most of the job already so you can do it so if you believe in yourself you can do it and you manage your time and try to manage like sometimes you have to work um let's say 20 hours a week and buy this expensive purse this is like very personal and i'm not supposed to say it but i'm saying what i did like i did work 10 hours a week but i did cook at home like whenever I had time, I said, okay, this is my fun now. I'm going to cook for the week and I'm going to save the food because I had to take care of my younger brother also when I was going even high school. So um, it was, it did save me a lot of time that I didn't have to work long hours and I was able to manage the time. So if you, if, if the desire is there, if you want it, you can do it. Just believe in yourself. Thank you so much. And lastly, we I do have a question for you, Tolu. Um, hold on, I do have. Okay, so Yesenia, I, she's remarked that this is the hardest part of her life because she is a mother of two and trying to finish her bachelor's. So yes, you're not alone, Yesenia. I did it. Dr. Mamari did it. So many others before you have done it. Just Pace yourself, take your time, and have a plan is a, the best advice. Okay, so Tolu, you were busy. You were a busybody during your education. So my question to you is, um, can you repeat some of the benefits of being involved in so many different activities while in school? Because, you know, some students feel like it's straight education, straight coursework, go home and that's it. However, there are some times when getting involved in activities around campus can help you. And what would some of those be? Well, the first for me was developing myself in terms of developing my communication skills, becoming a better communicator in terms of reading and, and speaking and things like that. I did that to develop myself. Then the second aspect is financial, right? Going to school is, ex is expensive. I've seen people who finish school and they'll, they'll say they have a lot of loans, student loans. I don't have student loans because I, I worked out in school and also I got some fellowship then. I, I was able to receive some fellowship and scholarships based on the fact that I belong to the underrepresented category. And also they look at activities, collegiate services, mentoring, volunteering, just being supportive generally. I think that helped a lot financially and it just makes life comfortable for me. Okay. And I like I like that you always took time to celebrate your big accomplishments or even small accomplishments. And celebrating small tasks sometimes is better than celebrating an entire goal because those small tasks keep you motivated for that end goal. So I thank you for sharing that within your presentation as well. You're welcome. So I would like to end with a comment from Dean Vaughn, who is the Dean of the STEM Pathway. And this is in regards to the faculty participants. Okay, so Dean Vaughn said that she is so honored to be working with all of these inspiring professors and she is EC proud. So if you know about our college, we love to support our faculty. We like to uplift them. This is part of the reason why this series was put together as well. And we are proud of everyone that presented today and who will present in the future. In the future. <clears throat> Dr. Nilo Marine, who is still on the call. So with that, I thank you again for sticking the extra minutes to hear some of the Q&A. This will be published and emailed to you guys as soon as I get that link and have a great rest of your day.
Bye, thank you. You are welcome. And thank you, Dr. Vaughn. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. You were great support. You're welcome, Venush. Enjoy the rest especially, of your semester. <laughs> yeah, especially for me, it's not, it's not very easy, but you made it so smooth and nice.